everyone. Uh, my name is Viat. I'll, I'll introduce myself in a second, but um, we're going to wait for a few more attendees to jump in, and um, I'll get the, the go-ahead from from our hosts to actually start. Um, but, but thanks for joining us today. All right, I got I got the green light to start. So, um, hi everyone. Again, my name is Viat. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is presented by Gem and Codility. Uh, my name is Viat. I'm part of the Customer Talent Advisory Team at Gem. Um, I have the pleasure of advising our customers on uh, recruiting best practices, uh, working with our product team to make sure that we're building the right features for our users, and working with our marketing team to continue positioning Gem as a thought leader in the recruiting community. Uh, prior to Gem, I spent 10 years in recruiting between agency and in-house as both an IC as and a leader. Um, I'm excited to moderate today's discussion on how recruiting teams are shifting strategies for remote hybrid models. Um, before I hand the mic over to our speakers, I want to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, first, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand after the live session. The GEM team has also um, included some additional resources which are available through the related content section in the webinar console. Uh, we'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free to send it to the Ask Questions section in the webinar console. And we'll be answering the questions at the end of today's discussion. And lastly, I encourage you to participate in the attendee chat. I have a lot of fun with it. And you'll see kind of in the questions tabs below, um, share your perspectives, comments, and virtual snaps for our speakers. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome our speakers for today's webinar and allow them to introduce themselves. Let's go in the order I have you on my screen. Um, so we'll go Paul, Lauren, and then Jeremy. Thanks, Viet. <clears throat> um, I am a tech sourcing manager at Coinbase. Um, been in sourcing specifically for the past eight, nine years. Similar to Viet, <clears throat> there's some agency, moved in-house, but I've been focused on tech companies, engineering teams, now moving over to broadly product design. Happy to be here, happy to be in sourcing. Love to share more. Hi, everyone. Lauren. I, I'm Lauren. I am currently leading uh, Grammarly's Global Business Recruiting. Um, I've been in the HR kind of recruiting space for a little over a decade. Initially started my career actually in the retail world and then um, made the jump over to tech and honestly have not looked back. Um, been able to be a part of a lot of really great companies and helping grow the teams. Um, and I'm super excited to be on the panel today. And I'm Jeremy Schmidt. I am the Director of Global Talent here at Codility. Uh, 25 years technical recruiting background and really excited to join the chat today. Very nice. Well, uh, very excited that you all are here. We have a, a very diverse set of um, experiences we can draw from. So uh, let's jump in. So many companies are transitioning to remote or hybrid working models. But that means different things to different companies. Um, We'd love to understand, you know, what did your company's uh, model look like prior to 2020? Um, and then what does it look like now? And I imagine most, most of you are going to say either remote or hybrid. And so, like, what does remote or hybrid look like at your company? Um, let's start with Lauren. Yeah, for sure. So prior to the pandemic, Grammarly was actually 100% in office. As a company, we really believe in kind of in-person interactions have really aided in collaboration and just resulting in innovation for our products since our product really touches the masses. And then like all companies, right? And basically overnight, we as a company had to figure out how we were gonna work from home. And we have essentially adapted to kind of our new working ways and we've really kind of learned and evolved through that. And so since, since then, Grammarly has actually shifted to a remote first hybrid. We're gonna be really putting that into place starting in 2022. And we're really excited, excited about it. Um, we really kind of took the best of both worlds, I guess, if you will, right? And brought them together. And we're really excited and believe that this balanced approach gives us our team members kind of the best of those different worlds, plenty of focus time as well as in-person collaboration that can continue to kind of foster trust hopefully unlock uh, creativity and really can continue to accelerate innovation for us. Nice, Paul, what about you? Thanks. Um, yeah, <clears throat> similar to um, before COVID, it was definitely in an office environment. I wasn't here for it. I just joined Coinbase this year. But ever since that I've heard about Coinbase being a remote first company, 
some of the changes I have seen is already moving towards what we at core are doing, which is decentralizing the financial system. We're also decentralizing ourselves in a way that we're getting rid of our headquarters in SF and we're fully embracing what we can do, I guess, at home and giving the right stipend, the setup and resource needed to make this work. Um, we do know that some people don't have maybe the home space for a work from home setup. So we are setting up more things to go a little bit beyond just you are okay to work remote, but actually embracing being a remote first company. One, by actually just offering some WeWork credit for people to actually go into a WeWork working space if they want to. Um, if they actually are situating in one of the places where we actually do have a, not a headquarter, but a satellite office, people are more than welcome to go in anytime they want. They just kind of pop in, pop out, whatever flexible for them. But moving forward, we are trying to make figure out a lot more documentation to give guidelines to everyone on the company to figure out, yes, it's remote first, but how do we plan activities? How do we plan get togethers? How do we budget travels to bring the team together once a quarter, once a year? So we're working a lot to make sure that systematically we have a way for the company to plan how to get together, what's the guidelines. So we actually are giving the equitable experience to everyone wherever they're located at. But yeah, that's a little bit about yeah, that's great. Home base. Yeah, we, we've done something very similar at Codility. Um, so prior to 2020, uh, very much was an in-office you know, type organization like most. And then since the pandemic hit, have, have just really tried to listen to our people. So I'm sure a lot of organizations have surveyed um, you know, all their different locations to understand what you know, your employees are telling you. And ours was pretty dramatic that they wanted to, to work remote, but they also wanted to have some type of opportunity to get together to, to foster that collaboration. So we moved to a 100% remote uh, organization and we rolled out sort of our philosophies around that. But then we also kept our hubs in uh, San Francisco, London, Warsaw and Berlin for those that still wanted to go into the office, whether that's once a week or five times a week. We want to give everybody the flexibility to to be an adult and decide you know, what was best for them. Uh, and we also rolled out a little bit of a different travel policy. So if an individual wanted to you know, go to Barcelona and work for two months, we, we put in some stipulations where they could work with their managers to arrange that. So at the end of the day, uh, we try to bring our teams together once per quarter and then the entire organization once per year. And then we give managers the budget to be able to have those offsites with their individual team members. So a little bit of a hybrid approach, but very much geared towards 100% remote. Nice. And uh, this is a bit off script, but you know, I think because most of us worked in office prior to COVID, um, and so now that we can be remote, it's like the new thing. But that new thing isn't so new anymore. We're, we're two years into it. And so personally, I'm curious like what your preference is. Personally, like it, would you prefer to go into the office? Would you prefer to work from a beach in Hawaii, you know, 365 days a year or something in between? I'll, I'll I jump think in. for me and I, go ahead, Paul. Sorry, um, I, I, I like just having a choice. Um, I am not the most set schedule person. And sometimes I literally just make that decision when I wake up. Probably not a great answer. I hope my boss is not listening in, but uh, having that choice is great. I do love some in-person activities. I do love going to happy hours or just lunch and seeing people. Um, but given family arrangements, things that are happening here and there, um, having any choice is great. And I know a lot of places even offer like, how about two days or three days or having a set schedule. I think that works well, but I honestly just feel bad that I'm making a last minute decision the day off at times. I am very much embracing to not have to go in, but having the choice to go in. So that's just me. Yeah, and I was gonna say, I hate to age myself a little bit, but I was very much the, you know, be in the office at 7.45 and start work at eight. And uh, as the pandemic hit, that drastically changed for me. 
Um, but now I've 100% adopted much more towards the, the work remote uh, philosophy. I feel I'm much more productive. I use my time more um, effectively. And I love to be able to take the kids to the school in the morning and pick them up and go to an activity and have that opportunity where for 25 years, never could I have ever gone to school and had you know parent lunch day with the kids. So having that flexibility, um, I really appreciate that. I would echo everything. I would say the flexibility piece has just been huge. I also have a small child, so being able to take her to daycare and kind of do the pickup piece has just been invaluable. I did, of course, come into the office today because I wanted to make sure I had really strong internet. So just like the flexibility of choice and is really great for me. And I do love, you know, I do get energized, I would say, by meeting the teams in person and seeing people and connecting face to face. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I added in there because I, I think it was, it's a good reminder that we're all like TA professionals and we do this for work. We're also people too, and we have our personal preferences. So uh, thanks for sharing. Um, so back to our, back to our uh, kind of agenda, you know, what are some of the big challenges or opportunities you see in recruiting strategies or practices now that your, your uh, organization has turned to your remote first um, hybrid model? So like, where are the pros, where are the cons? Uh, let's start with uh, Paul. Yeah. Um... In a remote first environment, we are relying a lot on automatically tracking software to somehow track your progress. As a managing a team or any companies managing anyone's productivity, um, it was easy to just look at someone when they clock in, when they clock out, are they staying late, are they talking to people? But in a remote first situation, you, you don't have those sometimes a little bit of bias queue of tracking who is working well. So we're relying a lot more on like objective measurements and hopefully a lot of times just measure with software automation tools to actually just understand like what are people doing every hour of the workday. So there's a lot of opportunity to start talking about being data driven decision in any everything that we do. So in a remote first setting, it kind of forces us to do a lot more of data tracking and having a lot of tools help us in all functions to actually drive towards that data-driven core of everything that we do. Um, but yeah, um, I think we are uh, pretty mature in using this in our sourcing function, just because been in the space for a while, like we have always been tracking entire funnel, entire uh, higher rate conversion rates, everything that is very data-driven. So. We're very glad that making this transition in our sourcing function has actually been quite easy because we have the tools in place to do so. Yeah, and I think piggybacking on the data piece as you cast a wider net for talent now that everything is remote, having some type of structure around uh, what does great look like and how do you measure that, right? So you have consistent process across all your different locations so that everyone isn't doing everything differently. Uh, but I think one challenge that we had, too, was we had to to sort of retrain some of our managers. You know, it's a different environment when you're managing a remote workforce. And let's be honest, a lot of us had no experience in those areas. And it's one thing to assess someone's ability to do a job. And now you're adding in it's another thing to assess their ability to do the job and be 100 percent remote. And all of the challenges, you know, that come along with working through a pandemic and that uncertainty. So we definitely um, created some budget to help train our managers a little bit better on feedback loops and consistent coaching and managing um, so that we could do a better job of, of working with our associates. The, oh, it's man, kind of funny I feel like, the... I, it, I was just gonna add, it's like uh, I had direct reports for, I can't, for as long as I can remember until like my current role and I feel like being a manager during, like managing remotely, where like we weren't actually taught how to do that, is is a whole different challenge. So honestly, I commend all of you. Uh, as I know you all have direct reports, I know your job is not easy, and managers never get enough love. So this is me saying love your way. Like I know your job's hard. Appreciate the love. Um, one thing I was gonna say, um, Jeremy, you mentioned kind of retraining the managers. I think even just interviewing over, you know, Zoom 100% of the time or Google Hangouts or whatever platform you utilize is something we had to train our interviewers a little bit differently on. What is the etiquette? Like, where do you look into the camera? All that kind of stuff was just like a different kind of challenge, something we hadn't initially thought about. And then from like a recruiter lens, 
the ability to like used to be able to swing by your hiring manager's desk when you needed something. I used to literally be notorious for leaving the post-it note, like, give me my feedback. I'll be back kind of a thing or <laughs> gently stalking their calendar and saying, I'm going to go meet him in the, the kitchen for coffee so I can get my X, Y, and Z. So that's kind of been, I would say a little bit more of a challenge, but the benefit I think really has outweighed a little bit of these challenges, being able to like for Grammarly specifically, being able to tap into different demographics that we traditionally hadn't been able to because we were really, you know, hub specific. So San Francisco, Vancouver, New York, and then Ukraine for us. So being able to now tap into these new markets has been super exciting for us. And we're excited by just being able to diversify uh, the candidates that we're able to see as a company. Actually, Lauren, to expand on that, can you change actually, can you, you actually elaborate uh, how you've uh, approached moving into new geos? That's something that uh, I, I frankly have not sourced in a while. And so I can't really wrap my head around this idea of like, you know, I've been sourcing for software engineers in San Francisco for, for as long as I can remember. And now it's like, oh, now we can expand past that, but it still feels like the majority are like kind of in like these metros. And so like, how have you, how, how have you and your team, especially you on the business side, um, like identify which kind of uh, geos that, where you could tap into where you can get kind of equally qualified candidates um, outside of like your standard metros? Yeah, for sure. It was definitely something for us to kind of wrap a strategy around and kind of put a foundation, I would say, in place first. So the first thing we did was actually look at our internal, we call ourselves Grammarlians. Uh, Paul, I know that's your favorite term, um, but look <laughs> at where our current Grammarlians are at and have they moved outside of the hub offices? And then if so, we needed to set up that as a place that we could definitely continue payroll. And then beyond that, we utilized a ton of market mapping. So um, we use Seekout as uh, one of our tools and it's really phenomenal at just doing really broad market mapping. So being able to type in more skill sets specifically, and then see kind of based off of that, where are these deep populations of individuals? And that helped us really identify where should we kind of focus our areas and kind of drive a little bit of that strategy specific. And then, you know, we're still rolling out, you know, a lot of the states and doing that, but we're, we're seeing a lot of just like data based off of like, where are our applications coming in or where are referrals coming in and using that data to help our um, strategy as well. Fascinating. So effectively using, uh, Seek out just to kind of reiterate. So, using Seek out to under, understand kind of where the skill sets are kind of in the country, and then also uh, using your own team of like where are they going as as a second point, and then furthermore is um, is uh, effectively kind of seeing where applicants or referrals are coming from, and like kind of using using that as a uh, at least where to start. That, that's great, yep. um, Paul. Mm -hmm. I know you you have a lot of thoughts on this because you've. Uh, you've worked for largely kind of global companies where you've recruited, like you've sourced from everywhere. And so like, how do you think about this? Yeah, I know this is one of the questions that it was going to come up anyways, but I know I talk a little bit about just because we expanded our talent pool to be like national, international, it doesn't really change the fact that our managers are looking for people in FANG, the big tech companies, and they're still very grounded in certain geo locations. So yes, I can hire someone in, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere, but the talent isn't there, the company isn't there, the school isn't there. It, it doesn't actually make that a reality. A um, couple of things that I've seen at other companies, um, I guess, namely Google, when I was there, is just that they have a very standardized interviewing process and they have the resource to interview a lot of people. So wasting interviewer time isn't a concern. Like I'm willing to interview 20 people just in case I don't miss out on the one good person. But most companies don't have the resource to spend the time, even if you use automatic software to uh, automate the beginning screening process, it's still an investment in finding them, getting them through the process. So that was a strategy that I guess Google was able to do. Let's just get people in. Let's not miss out on any good talent. But to even do that, you need to fully trust your process, trust that there's an unbiased way to evaluate skills, regardless of what the resume looks like. And one of the most exciting thing, not my hire, but one of the most exciting candidates that passed through our interview process at Google was never went to CS, or whenever study CS is a tech support, went through like 25 Coursera courses about data structures algorithm, um, never had a software engineering job before, got the highest interviewing scores that we have seen that year. And 
Google hired this person. But currently, most companies don't have that resource time and the structure process to do so. Uh, we're trying really hard to actually make interviewing a lot more objective. We're employing a lot of tools to do so. But until we have a very set process in place that works, um, we're still going through some sort of struggles to just hire people that don't live in these geographic locations because they don't have those similar experience and skills. Yeah, and I think too from a, a yeah, Go I was going to say from Jerry. a sourcing perspective, how that changes how you reach out, right? So you're casting this wider net, you're going into territories where maybe you're not a household name, people don't know your organization, and in this day and age, candidates aren't interested in just the normal, you know, new title or higher pay, right? They want to know about what is your work remote policy and what do you consider what do you do for your employees from a mental health perspective and you know what is your remote first culture and and what can you tell us about that so what we saw when we were sending out a lot of messages and having a lower response rate is we needed to change our messaging to focus more towards what candidates are truly interested in as we cast you know this much wider net and as we started to address some of those things up front um, our response rate continued to go up and then we were able to pull more people in you know while casting that wider net I just want to underscore what Jeremy just said, because I think this is something that I think everybody could take away is that really think about kind of who you're trying to attract, what they care about, and put that into your messaging and address it up front as opposed to waiting for the interview process or whatever it is. Um, that's that's so simple, yet like I imagine to be incredibly effective. Uh, I'd love to unpack that a little bit more. So like, you know, what are you all seeing? Um, as like, what do candidates care about now or that are that's different than what they care about previously? I imagine uh, cafeteria lunches and and beautiful like high rise offices in San Francisco are less important these days. So if not that, then what? Yeah, I'll piggyback on um, what I was saying. It's it's all about the benefits. It's about the work life balance. It's about creating a culture that gives them more more purpose in their work. I think that's one thing that we've seen uh, come out of the, the great resignation, as they call it, is, is people want to feel more valued. They want to feel that they understand the bigger picture and they're more engaged and there's purpose behind their work. So I think giving them the opportunity to work in a, a safe and inclusive environment that lets them be 100% their authentic selves and see them working at your organization and, and how you build that into your, your sourcing and your messaging to give them some insight insights into that area, I think is huge because it's a candidate driven market. There's a huge supply and demand, um, you know, issue, especially on the engineering side of the fence. And people want to, to focus on those things more than just, you know, a senior in their title or an extra $5,000 of compensation, how it used to be in the past. I think people are much more concerned with, with what does that mean for me personally as a human being? And can they see themselves working at your company? I would 100% agree. And I would even kind of lean into the piece of like, people are, I seem to be more driven by kind of like the mission and kind of like values of a company where previously, I think like, you know, the free lunches, the ping pong tables, those little kind of things really did kind of excite. And I feel like they've, they're not as exciting. And so it's really about how can you ensure that candidates are really able to kind of get a peek into your company, a peek into the culture? How can you showcase that over your first in-mail or, you know, in your interview process? So like one thing Grammarly had to do quickly was the, like literally the day before we went remote with the pandemic, we actually had one of our recruiting coordinators actually walk around and do like a video of the office so that if and when we went back, they could really, you know, get a sense of what the office environment was like. And then being able to like showcase the culture of the company and how their role would come in and how it would impact like the greater good of the company. So I would say being able to showcase that, but just like highlight um, specifically kind of what they would do and what their role in the impact of the company would be. All right. I, I try to think about this a little differently because everything you two mentioned makes a lot of sense. What I have to add is I feel like I've only been competing against with all the companies that have free lunches, free shuttle service, free swag every Friday. Uh, just everything is like t the typical of, of what every company can throw at an employee. That's always the case. With candidates now, we're... I'm, I'm talking to a candidate and he's like, I've been with my team for four years. I met them in person. 
how am I going to create the same bond now that I don't see these, these team in person? I can't go to happy hours. I can't have lunch with them. I don't see them. And I have candidates with Drew just because they don't feel like they can have the same bond now that everyone is remote. Um, one thing that we've been doing at Coinbase is um, trying to replicate some of that. Everyone is actually given like a stipend, like you can go expense like a coffee or a breakfast every, like once a week or once every two weeks. Just go meet someone random. Go order DoorDash, Uber Eats together, and you guys can expense that, hoping to create some sort of like, let's have coffee together. We're also doing a lot of things where if people are in the office, you're explicitly told not to dial in from the conference room because someone that is in the conference room talking to each other is going to be more connected than the two people that is on Zoom or on Google Meet that can't really hear what is happening in, in person. So everyone is asked to dial in from the laptop so then we can see the face of the person they're talking to instead of being feeling like they missed out. At the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that everyone has an equitable experience somehow remotely. So even when we plan in-person events, if like 85% of the team can't go, you can't go. Like we're really trying to make sure that these are the things that we're telling the candidates. So we're not just, you're missing out because you're remote and other people aren't. Everyone is remote. And if you feel like this is the right place where you can have a work-life balance, be flexible in your ways, we are going to do everything and improving the ways that we can bond better and better. We're not there yet, but we're really putting a focus and a team to figure out all these things that really make you bond like you would have if you actually work in the office. A little ways to go, but we're trying to get there. I think it's I think it's quite fascinating because there, there's a very a nuanced difference between uh, hybrid and remote first or remote and remote first. Uh, like. Paul, to your point, is that uh, not having people in conference rooms, having side conversations, whereas like the third person is on vi on Zoom and they can't participate in that conversation, like that that is very kind of like I think a remote culture. Whereas like if you're remote first, actually I worked at this company I found to be really odd. This is like in 2017. I worked at this company for a while, and uh, it, even if you're in like a roundtable meeting, like if we're all in a conference room and there's a one person remote, every single person would have their laptop up on Zoom and we would share like one speaker so that that person could still see every single person in that room. I thought it was like the weirdest practice, but now that we're in this like kind of remote environment, that makes so much sense because uh, there are plenty of people that I see in conference rooms like, oh, who is that? Is it, who's sitting behind that person? And I feel, I do feel like I'm the, um, the odd person out. So I think it means like, uh, you know, trying to kind of create practices that uh, creates uh, equitable experiences for everybody. And we spent a lot of time talking about um, how do you support uh, people who want to be remote, but just like maybe looking at the other side of the coin, like how are you all thinking about um, supporting the folks who want to be in office, but like, but they don't uh, have that opportunity because the company is largely remote. Like how, how do you all think about that? Yeah, we've given everyone global WeWork access to where they live if they wanted to, to rent space or, or to go in. Um, we're also trying to do monthly um, some type of events to bring people together depending on their, their geographic areas. So we have budgeted you know, to do something once a month, whether that's a happy hour or everyone goes out to a dinner in different locations to, to try to facilitate more of the face-to-face. The um, so again, I think it just comes to listening to your people and, and trying to create those opportunities um, for them to have, have that face time or, or to be able to go into a space if they need to or want to. Grammarly has it where we're actually doing each quarter, um, like an individual contributor, for example, can be into their, should expect to kind of come into our office or a hub office, I should say, about two weeks a quarter and then managers upwards of up to four weeks. And the thought behind that is still being able to, again, balance the two worlds of remote first, but really making sure that you're not missing out of that in-person time. You get the one-on-one -on -one time with your manager. You get the one-on-one -on -one time for key projects, whether it's like a quarterly kickoff or you know, whiteboarding or whatever it may be. So we really tried to balance that. And we really, as a company, have really leaned really heavy into like what Paul mentioned, like making sure that everybody has the same experience and that, 
you know, if and when promotion times happen, they don't feel like the person who goes to the office more is getting it versus the person who is remote. So as a company, we've been very mindful of that. Yeah, something um, actually one of the attendees said that I really liked, which was uh, effectively like learn new hobbies, find new communities kind of uh, outside of work to actually build friendships. It's like, that's such a foreign concept because I mean, for most of us, we spend most of our lives at work. And so naturally your friend, your friend base and your community is at work. Now that you don't have that, then just go find somewhere else. But it's, um, it's, it's, it's weird that that's weird, right? <laughs> that you should have like friends outside of work. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, Paul, sorry, I, I interrupted you, but no, that's actually what I was going to go off of. Um, um, I think in growing from another culture where, um, work is also work may or may not be the most important thing but it, in in us there is a pride to be taken about like my job is part of my identity and a lot of people do spend and enjoy seeing their coworkers because at the end of the day we're we see our coworkers more than almost anyone else and that's a huge part of who we are and our, our circle of friends i love that someone brought up like just go find other friends maybe uh, that would be one thing um I'll probably say for people who want to work in person, if that's really what you want, then remote first company isn't for you. Like just, it is not, it, unfortunately that's just what it is. Um, go find a place that are like sit in, everyone sit together. And that's a very exciting place to be. But um, Coinbase where we just have the whole model where we're trying to decentralize finance, decentralize things. And so if you're if you're about our mission about decentralization, then you're probably going to be a little bit more okay with um, not having a centralized office location. Yeah, that's totally fair. Um, you know, getting back into kind of, I think, some more tactical things for especially, I know if a lot of folks here are like, I need to figure out how like I can make this work. And so maybe like one question for, for you all is like, what are some tools that you're using to help build pipeline and stay organized that you're now engaging prospects in different time zones and locations? Uh, I know you want to say gem, but outside of gem, or even how are, if you're going to say gem, how are you using gem? Uh, Lauren. I guess I can. Oh, Lauren. <laughs> I'm happy to kick it off. Jem, yes. Um, I would say we as a company and specifically like recruiting have really looked through the lens of how can we help automate as much as possible and kind of free up recruiters time, especially with, you know, it is a candidate's market. So we're doing a lot more reach outs to, to get to that kind of that higher. And so LinkedIn is still really kind of our bread and butter, but we definitely, you know, Jem, we've layered on it for all of our sequencing. I mentioned Seek Out previously as well. That's again, helped us a ton with more of market mapping and being able to really look at new kind of markets. It does have this really amazing kind of AI feature that really is um, pretty great too. In addition to that, we've looked at like Calendly, for example, just to help automate again, the process of like that initial kind of recruiter stream and hopefully getting people onto um, candidates onto recruiters calendars faster and things like that. And, and to piggyback that uh, a little bit, Lauren, we've sort of changed our philosophy with some internal tools around our, our salary and benchmarking. So we've looked at it a little bit differently too of how we can attract the pipeline and cast that wider net. So what we did is we rolled out a one US pay band for all of our roles, but we benchmarked off uh, San Francisco prices. So as we cast a wider net, net from a sourcing perspective, if you want to make San Francisco dollars, but be a dairy farmer in Wisconsin, as long as you're hitting your deliverables and milk those cows earlier in the morning, right? We're 100% comfortable with that. So our philosophy around that has changed a little bit to we want to pay A prices for A players, expect A deliverables, uh, but give them the ability to to live their life and, and, and do things that they want to do. And so that's been successful as we've cast that wider net from a, a sourcing perspective. Um, nothing to add about Gem. Gem is great. Calendly is great. Tools are great. Schedule send make it seems like we don't work around the clock, even though sometimes we do. As recruiters and sorcerers, we all kind of do that a little bit. But yes, schedule send really helps. Um, uh, Jeremy talked about a little bit of uh, having single pay ban across everywhere. That's actually really exciting. We're not there yet, and I don't know we'll get there. But another exciting thing that we do is we get 
everyone to be on the same pay target are for everyone that is getting into the same position. I guess another way of saying it is if you're a senior engineer in San Francisco, every senior engineer in San Francisco gets exactly the same pay, no differences. Everyone gets the same amount, regardless of how long you've been here. So there's also no merit increase per se. The pay for performance is going to be differentiated every year at performance review. But by having a single pay point target, we take the negotiation out. We take the ban out where people are getting paid more or less because they negotiate better or worse. All of that is out the door. We just focus a lot more on equity and everyone don't have to negotiate to get there. I know there's probably a lot of concern, but just to point out the positive is if you do get a promotion, you're no longer being promoted to the bottom of the next band. You're getting promoted right to the single pay target point of the next level. So your increase will be significant and meaningful. Viet, I know that wasn't a question. I'm sorry I jumped in there, but I thought it would be good, good to share. No, that's great. Um... And kind of, I think uh, one of the questions we're getting kind of in attendee chat, and we're gonna, we're actually gonna break in a few minutes to kind of go through uh, the Q and A. We're getting a lot of great questions. But I think one that that's relevant, um, that I think everyone wants to hear about, is this diversity. So now that you know we're able to to hire across the U.S., um, the idea that uh, you're not bound by like a certain city's like uh, demographic anymore, and so like how are how is expanding the aperture for where you can source can is how's that affected your um, diversity sourcing or diversity hiring metrics I, I think it's huge i think it gives us all an opportunity to look in the mirror and self-assess in areas where we have underutilization and put sourcing plans into place to drive a more diverse pipeline to the top of the funnel and really focus on removing a lot of that unconscious bias that we all know exists that we all you know sometimes don't talk about right to create a structured process and give everyone that same opportunity and being equitable and fair so my, my diversity strategy is always to to seek out areas of where um, you know the pipeline is filled with those that you're, you're trying to recruit and partnering with organizations that that can help um, from an employer branding perspective and getting you in front of the people that you're trying to recruit. So I think being able to cast that wider net has opened up a whole new world to, to how we can focus on driving innovation by building more diverse teams. I would echo that. And a big part of it, I would say, is like being able to, you mentioned, kind of like invest in new communities and like make a kind of a, a name for yourself or just introduce your company as, you know, a company that previously they maybe wouldn't have thought about. So definitely looking at new ways, like Latinas in Tech was a big, um, something that our company actually was a great partner with for last quarter, Afrotech currently going on. So being able to make sure that we're showing up for these new events that previously, you know, if they were just San Francisco, we were in it, but now we're really able to go uh, across the US or different provinces within uh, Canada, et cetera. They all covered it, nothing else to add there. All sounds great. And hope these are the things that we also are doing too. Nice. Um, we'll we'll wrap up here and jump into Q and A, but let's let's end with with uh, uh, the favorite question of the day. I think, in, at least in my opinion, you know, what's the one piece of advice you you uh, have for all recruiters who are still unsure um, what their work environment will be in the future, and um, and what would it be? So I guess like to just to kind of reiterate, like what kind of what's one piece of advice you would give to folks who are now moving into like um, remote remote first, having done it yourself. Happy to kick it off. I would say the first thing is just understand kind of like the larger plan, right? Like being able to take a step back and really understand kind of the foundation of what you're trying to build mm -hmm. and all the different facets that will go in that. So you think about going remote is amazing, but you have to think about, you know, tax wise, are we set up to actually pay employees in these different states? Or do we have the correct entities there? Are we setting ourselves up liable potentially for our company if we don't do that? Um, and then thinking about the experience that you're going to bring to your employees and how you're going to maintain kind of your strong culture or your values or make sure everybody is still connected. So being able to think, think about all those different facets, and I would say really making sure that you have a collective decision and are talking to a lot of different people. Um, everybody, again, values different things and just making sure you think about those different things that are really valued for your employees before really like launching into kind of a game plan, I would say. 
Yeah, we do. We we haven't quite made our decision yet, and I think our our executive team has done more surveys and count as like as far as like how are you feeling now? Because it's true, it, it has changed like over time. Um, yeah, Paul, I know you had some thoughts around kind of I think really thinking about what what each person cares about. But yeah, would you want want to share? Yeah. Um, uh, I Lauren Gray covering like the just the legally and HR wise, like, is it possible? Can we do it for companies? Um, I think maybe I'll tackle a little bit on just people, employees. I know they all have differences and Vid, you also asked like, what do people prefer face to face? We're just trying to make sure that we have the system and processes set up for everyone to be engaging in some way. So as long as we are, your company itself is set up to provide some sort of engagement levels for people. I think we're okay as employees. Individually, it's it's going to be up to you to decide. Like, is working from home really the best choice for you? And for most, it's easy to say yes, but it's really different for everyone. I think amongst the people that I get to talk to, if you're like wanting to be in office, you almost seems like an odd one out. Like, of course you want flexibility. Of course we should work from home. It seems like the cool thing to do, but it really doesn't work for everyone. And if that's not the case, feel comfortable saying no and decide it's working remotely and having a remote first culture, really good fit for you. And it's completely okay to say no. Yeah, and when I think about where organizations have made mistakes, moving to a remote first culture and, and what my tip or trick would be, it's to make sure you define and build a structured process around how you're trying to hire and what you're trying to measure. Because I think so many companies cast this wider net and, oh, we can hire anybody, but if they're doing things differently across their different areas, they're just setting themselves up for failure long run if they, if they don't have that. So build a data first process that's repeatable, that's scalable, that everyone can measure the same competencies against the same rubric so that you're, you're keeping consistency in, in who you're hiring and why. So I think having that set up really helps you expand to, to remote first. Yeah, I think if I were to add kind of one thing is, and I think it's it's maybe overarching to kind of what, what you just shared, Jeremy, which is um, <clears throat> going remote is not easy. Like, and going to remote first is not easy. There are many challenges that exist uh, with it. Um, and Paul, to your point, I don't think in theory it sounds good, but it may actually not work for you as a person. And so I think being really honest with yourself, with your organization of like what actually makes sense. And then furthermore, like process, documentation, all those things need to be like locked tight. Like it, uh, that's kind of how communication breaks when you don't have those things in place, especially being remote. And so I think being really clear about what needs to be accomplished if you were to move towards remote first, depending on the size of the organization, that may be something that you can do over a course of three months, a quarter, two quarters, sometimes even a year. And so there are probably teams that are dedicated to like uh, helping organizations move to being remote first. And so I just, I think my one piece of advice would be just like, don't take it lightly because I think it's a hard decision. And they're also the work to follow is also equally as hard. Um, great. So thank you so much for the insights and learnings. This is a lot of fun, um, always. Uh, before we wrap up and get into Q&A, uh, we have one final poll question for the audience. We'd like to give um, the attendees an easy way to request a demo of GEM. Um, you should now see a poll on the side. Uh, in On the slide section, are you interested in scheduling a demo for GEM? Uh, select yes um, or no, or and someone from our sales teams will follow up with you as soon as possible to get a um, demo scheduled. Um, and spoiler alert, all the speakers you've heard from today happen to be GEM customers who use GEM for their recruiting strategy. Um, but uh, the, the poll's up. I'm going to go ahead and give it a, a second. Um, hopefully, you all can see it. But um, we'll give it a second, and then we'll jump into q and I'm going to read through all the questions now so I can figure out uh, what questions to ask first. And by the way, if you ask a question during during like during the session and we don't answer it, uh, the Gem team is generally pretty good about actually answering these questions after the fact and sending out uh, like a blog post of like answering all these questions. So um, don't be discouraged if your your question isn't answered; it'll get answered one way or another. Okay, all right. So let's jump into it. Um, so uh, the first question we have is um, what. Are, what have been the biggest things that have helped you with recruiting remotely 
in a hybrid model now that everyone is attempting to do it. So how are you, what are you doing that's different than everybody else? I can jump in there. I don't, I, I wouldn't say we're doing anything like fancy or different, right? But I think again, I would lean into the being able to really showcase your company and what makes your company kind of stand out and what the opportunity itself is and the impact that that candidate can bring. And so it's more about, I would say like reaching out with that more personalized tailored approach and really leaning into um, some of the deep motivators. But I wouldn't say there's anything crazy that we've done differently. That's like our secret sauce. I think it's just been being able to cast that wide net and uh, showcase our personality of our company. Yeah, yeah same and for I think... me. Go ahead, Jeremy. All right, Paul, go ahead. Uh, I guess so, I'll, yeah, I'll I... go. <laughs> Sorry, that's a delay. Hi, All right, Paul. Oh, okay. no. right. I'm making the call. Paul, I'm uh, directing traffic here. Echoing Lauren, nothing's different. Just like we pitch company on mission statement, team culture, people, project opportunity, we just add remote working situations to that list. Yeah, and I think from a sourcing perspective, putting much more focus on our culture. And then one thing we did change where we've seen um, some significant uh, positive feedback is we also offer candidates the opportunity to interview us as much as we're interviewing them. So something that we lead with or, or talk about a lot in our messaging is if they want to speak to maybe a member of one of our ERG groups or maybe even a member of our executive team about what it truly is like to work here in a remote first culture, we want to give them that opportunity. And you can see uh, how engaging that makes the candidate feel on their side, but also how uh, members of our ERG groups, right? They feel like they're more engaged in the process and they can bring more to the table. So I think on both sides of the fence, that's been a real positive impact of what we've changed a little bit from our sourcing and messaging and, and process as well as to be a little bit more candidate first and give a better experience and more of that white glove service, I guess. And I, so I came with the, I mean, I didn't come up with it, but I effectively started using uh, the concept of a reverse interview um, years ago. I, I think I had a company I worked at in 2017. And uh, actually, I wrote a blog about it, explained it. I'm going to share it in the chat now. Feel free to read it. Feel free to use it uh, by all means. Um, but I think the the general concept, and, and Paul or Jeremy, you said it almost exactly right, where it's like, we've interviewed you. Now you interview us. And giving them I think basically full reign. It's like, you can talk to anybody you want, whether it's ever from our CEO to the new hire who just started. Anybody is fair game. Uh, one of the interesting things we had someone do is they actually sat in one of our um, engineering planning meetings and because they want to see how product and engineering kind of argue over what should be work done. And they want to know like kind of where, where how, how you resolve tension. And so um, that's absolutely right call. And, um, and uh, Lauren, to your point, like you're not doing anything, you may not be doing anything interesting or fancy, but what I've realized in recruiting is that I feel like nothing we like any of our teams are doing that is like super creative or anything like that. It just comes down to execution. Like the idea is important. It's like whether you can execute the idea uh, consistently and reliably every single time. And if you can do that, you're going to win like more time, more often than not. So um, the ideas are great, but uh, it comes down to execution. Um, all right, next question. So um, let's see. Uh, you kind of touched on this early, uh, Jeremy. Like, how how exactly do you address your work from home policies in your kind of initial outreach? Um, so, what we've done is we've created um, some like one pagers on sort of some of our different policies and things that we want to stress in our culture. And so depending if we're working on a certain engineering role, uh, and I know it's on a certain team, right? We, we, we know what that team's doing, the interesting problems they're solving and why someone might be attractive. And then we can sort of tie that in, um, you know, with more about the culture and some of our policies so that we're putting that out there. So in the initial message, uh, whether we can attach uh, a document to say, hey, you know, check out our work remote policy and how we're, we're dealing with the pandemic, um, or if it's just, you know, um, you know, check out our glass door and here's a link to what it's like to work here. And, and you know, we want to look at culture focused and PB people focused first and leading with that rather than just leading with the, 
hey, I need five backend engineers. Are you interested in talking with us, right? Going a totally different approach. And we've seen our response rate uh, drastically increase, um, focusing more on the people side. Paul, you manage a relatively large sourcing team. I'm curious like how you all are, how you all are incorporating this in your kind of uh, sequences. Um, can you like incorporate in sequence like working or emailing or something else? Sorry. Yeah, like like how do you talk about kind of work from home or how do you talk about like kind of the the working culture at, at Coinbase? Um I, I don't know if there was a huge thing that we do or if anything, other than the fact that we're remote first and covered a lot of maybe talking points that I covered earlier. Nothing else beyond that, other than when candidates are really concerned about are we really going to get the in-person environment like we would have if we were to have an in-office working space? And I guess the simple answer is no, it's never going to be exactly the same. But it's just that we kind of bring it up front. We talk about the flexibility. And we give people the tools, the stipends, or things to help them get connected with everyone. And in the, today's age of using Slack, we maybe fortunately or unfortunately have about like, a hundred Slack channels talking about everything in the company and it's up to you to participate or not participate. So that's just another way for us to actually get connected with other people. Yeah. Um, this is a really good question. Um, do you feel like talent expectations for your organization have increased now that you're working 100% remotely? Um, and kind of that, that first question isn't super clear to me, but the second one is, which is are hiring managers expecting um, higher caliber talent due to the shift, or how 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 have hiring managers um, how have they changed um, kind of as the environment changed? I can jump in with that one. I would say that our hiring bar, if you will, has not changed. Right, like it's definitely kind of maintained the same. But I think the openness of the team to really kind of like be open to those new geolocations, and with that, I think you know new schools and things like that that aren't like the traditional ones you would go after have been able to. We've really been able to kind of go after those types of candidates and kind of present them. But I wouldn't say like our bar, if you will, has changed. But just the ability to really kind of provide more of that larger top of funnel, like a, with a really good kind of diversity mix within it. And Jeremy, what about you? Um, you know, I, I definitely loop back to the, the hiring manager training that we talked about a little bit at the beginning. I think there has to be a little bit better understanding of, of how the process is going to be structured. And, and, and so they know what they're trying to, to measure as well as we go through. Um, and, and the challenges to, to doing all of the interviews virtually, you know, that's been a big change, especially in engineering, right? You can't have that candidate in the office and their fingers on the keyboard and them drawing on a whiteboard. And so we've had to leverage a lot of our own tools here at Codility, uh, especially on the engineering side to, to build that structure process, to create a better candidate experience and help our managers, you know, coach through that process to, to sell a little bit more too, right? Candidates have all the upper hand and they can pick and choose a lot of times where they're going to go. So the managers need to be a little bit more salesy too in their approach um, to giving and, and describing interesting problems that we're trying to solve to, to get those engineers attention. It feels I purposely like, wait until you uh, talk first so I don't interrupt him in the middle of him talking. Um, I hiring manager for us have not increased their bar It's the same, but they are still looking for the Google and Facebook engineers. And all of a sudden, I can't find Google and Facebook engineers in a location where Google and Facebook does not operate out of. So yes, we expanded our location, but nothing has made it easier because of the remote reasons. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially like I, I, I've had plenty of friends who've worked at Coinbase and I've heard the same thing year over year. And so none of that surprises me. Um, uh, here's like a really tactical question. Um, how do you feel about videos or do you do uh, video interviews for your initial screens? If, if so, why, if not, if not, uh, why did, why don't you do it actually? I guess more so like, what's your opinion on video using video for initial screens? 
like initial recruiter screens for talking? Yeah, or, or your, let's say yeah. recruiter screen or hiring manager screen, either way. I would say depends, but I would say for recruiter screen, I think the phone is best. Um, sometimes we'll do like Zoom audio if there's you know different time zones or something like that or faulty kind of in, uh, phone connection. So we've done that, but hiring screens, I'm totally okay with the face to face and getting to to be able to talk to each other and engage with each other. Um, it's definitely something where similar to Jeremy, we've had to kind of coach our hiring managers. It is different. It's a little bit more of that sell. It's making sure it's kind of a two-way street when you think about interviews and like leaving time to ask them questions or vice versa and really kind of showcasing some things that that make our teams kind of unique. Jeremy, I know Paul's waiting for you, so I'll let you go first. Um, I think Lauren hit the nail on the head. Um, I think a lot of those things are, are very, very applicable. So I, I think that was a great answer. Um, my last two Satoshis on this is it, it depends, but I I like to meet people face to face, but it's not always easy to, to make that arrangement. But for speed purpose, I just do phone. But if anyone candidates are willing to give me the face to face time, I would love to establish rapport up front. People work from home anyways. Um, and if they really want to get a closer understanding of how culture is like, I'll show my background, I'll kind of walk around the kitchen. I usually eat during my meetings, all my meetings. So it's just a little bit of flexibility that I'm just demonstrating by living this work from home culture. Yeah, I I haven't done a recruit screen in a while, but um or a hiring manager screen for that matter, but it's, I like being on the phone. Like that's what I know how to do. And it's like, I can, uh, I actually work better when I'm pacing. Like I, I'm much better on closing calls when I'm pacing as opposed to when I'm sitting. And so like the idea of having doing a closing call on Zoom would be quite challenging. So um, it, so I guess like maybe one way of thinking about it is that if you see like, if it works for you, by all means, try it. If it doesn't work for you, I don't think it can't expect to do video in our video screens. Um, and so, so is that. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. How has your interview process changed? Actually, that's actually a big one. Um, I feel like interview processes, especially on the engineering side, have had to change because you don't have a whiteboard, like not really at least. And so, uh, Jeremy, let's start with you. You were in Kodili. So like, I think this is like right up your alley as far as like, how do you all think about uh, remote interviewing? For let's say for for tech specifically, or and Lauren, if you want to answer, kind of like in in a way where it's like where you typically would have to do it in person, like presentations or whatever, maybe. Yeah, this is putting the ball on the tee for me to to hit a home run and, and pitch Codility a little bit here. But uh, you know, having our set of tools, and for those of you that don't know about Codility, um, it's a a platform that allows organizations to measure that technical aptitude at the top of the funnel while removing a lot of that unconscious bias, breeding a better candidate experience um, so that you can go through and, and drive a more diverse group of talented engineers through the top of that funnel and get them engaged in your process. So all of our tools, um, our virtual collaborative tools, you know, for, for design sessions, for paired programming, for more collaborative interaction between engineer and hiring manager. And you can build in certain data points of exactly what you want to measure. And again, while removing a lot of that unconscious bias and truly just measuring that technical aptitude. So um, before going to Codility, I hadn't used a tool like this before. And now I look back at my 25 years of technical hiring and I don't know how I lived without it. And you know the pandemic, in a weird way, has created the the perfect storm for Codility because every organization struggles now without being able to bring that engineer in and watch them write code of, of how to do that. Um, and so, if anyone is interested, feel free to ping me, and I can connect you with uh, you know our SDR team. For what's worth, we use we use Codility, so like def definitely a fan. Yeah. Paul, how's how's interviewing changed at uh, at Coinbase? Or technical technical interviews, I guess. Honestly, not much. Um, if anything, Jeremy covered it. We have tools to streamline that. So I, I, I maybe this is even simple question. Find the tools you want to use on the market, pay for it, and engineering wise, like it will it'll work and it'll be fine. Just to get managed to train on uh, train on it. Adding a tool is essential. So if people aren't used to doing anything remotely on their laptop, that's the new thing that we all have to change. But I feel like other companies have started to do this in the past few years. So it has become a lot easier. 
Nice. Lauren, what about you? I would say, um, so we definitely do a ton of presentations for sales roles, for example, but I would say the biggest change has been be being able to break up interviews across a couple days. And it's really, again, it's the candidate's market. So being able to lean into that, gone are the days of where candidates literally eight to five doing those back-to-back -back interviews and breaking that up has been a really kind of refreshing change, I would say. Um, and then from the presentation standpoint, it's being cognizant of how many interviewers you're bringing to a session. If it's somebody presenting, we don't want the candidate to feel overwhelmed we want to make sure everybody has great manners. We do want people to leave their cameras on so that the candidates feel that the presenters or that everybody's engaged. Um, and again, leaving time for, for questions. Nice. Yeah, breaking up interviews, like that, that's been huge. For both for court coordinators, I'm sure are so happy about that. Like no, no more back-to-back -back interviews, finding meeting rooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this was a ton of fun, everyone. Uh, I'm Paul, it's good to see you again. And Laura and Jeremy, it was great to meet you kind of through this experience. I learned a lot. Um, and knowing that we haven't really made our, our choices for what we're going to do yet, I personally, I learned a lot from this experience. And so um, I really appreciate all of your time. And for attendees, I appreciate you guys uh, showing up as well and, and participating. If you have any questions for, for any of us, I'm sure you can find any of us on, on LinkedIn. Um, we will follow up with the recording and et cetera. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thanks, Viet. See ya.